Ryan Donahue, the Program Director for Marketing Insights for National Research Corporation. Ryan has worked extensively with hospitals and health systems uh, to understand and leverage market intelligence to build effective healthcare brands. Ryan has worked with extensively with Mayo Clinic, Baylor Health, Trinity Health, and other valued clients of the National Research Corporation. He's helped them develop effective advertising, branding, and marketing strategies. R Ryan specializes in analyzing consumer decision-making to create simple yet effective models that any healthcare brand can use. Ryan has worked for the National Research Corporation for six years in the fields of marketing, product development, uh, brand management. Make your, whoa, here we go, the sound left again. Let me make your job really easy for you. Uh, the people in this room represent the best brand any hospital can have. Please welcome Ryan Donahue. Okay. I'm very excited to be here. I think this is going to be a great audience. And I, uh, before I start, I consider myself a little bit of an outsider here. This is my first symposium and first event where I'm surrounded by a lot of people who are very involved and responsible for quality. I talk to a lot of marketers, a lot of executives, a lot of CEOs. Uh, and I think there's going to be an interesting marriage uh, that happens here. Not an actual marriage. That would be a, an incredible attention getter. Um, but a marriage between two ideas that as they come together are going to form a very interesting concept that I, I hope to impart on you today. Uh, here's how we're going to get to it. We're going to talk first about the healthcare consumer. So we talk a lot about patients. I've heard customer. Uh, I've heard consumer a little bit. I'm going to talk a lot about the consumer. We're going to do consumer 101. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about consumerism, which is a rising force in healthcare, and part of the reason why I'm here in front of you. And we're going to talk about its effect and its interaction with value-based purchasing a very familiar concept to us. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the total experience. What if we put consumer and patient together? What happens? And also share some success stories and some takeaways for you to leave the conference and have some action plans when you go back to your hospitals and health systems. But first, the consumer. Let's talk a little bit about the consumer. Number one, confusion. Absolute confusion is the best way to describe the consumer. Confusion about health care. So we're all here, we work within healthcare, which makes us incredibly biased. And even us, even this group, gets confused about healthcare. It happens to me every day. Think about if you don't work in healthcare, if you're outside of that group, you don't have those biases, how confusing healthcare is. I talk a lot about branding, about the choices consumers make, and we go out and we do a lot of field work asking consumers about healthcare, and they know very little about it. And a lot of what they know is negative. So here's the other thing. When consumers think about healthcare, they think about hospitals, and they think, I don't want to go there. Maternity being an exception, there's a few like that. But for the most part, I don't want to go to the hospital. That's where the sick go. People might die there. And when I'm at the hospital, it means something bad has happened to me. That's what consumers think. We internally have a different perspective. We know the amazing treatments. We know the wonderful quality that we can impart. We know there's things that we can do to save someone's life right now that we couldn't five years ago. Consumers in general do not know that. So there's confusion. And what we have to do is make sure we're consistent, we're latent, we're always there, communicating our value to consumers time and time again. That's really the best way to reach consumers in any industry, but especially in healthcare. There's another influence at play, and that's the internet. Online behavior is affecting consumers in incredible ways. They are seeking online information at record levels. You see newspapers going out of business left and right. Consumers also generate more information than ever before. Think about social media, Facebook posts, tweets, all the things that are going on online, comments on websites, bloggers. All of this information is available, and it's consumer to consumer. It can cut the business right out. All of this information is imparting on consumers the idea that I've got information available, it's online, I should be able to see it, I should be able to generate my own opinion, and it should all happen in real time. Healthcare can run, but it cannot hide. I was listening to a couple of comments in uh, Maureen O'Neill's presentation about how we've got to think bigger than the patient, into the family, into the community, and healthcare itself has to adopt to the, the changing business trends that are now finally affecting the industry. And this is incredibly true. And if those changes were a vehicle, in the driver's seat, if you rolled down the window, you would find the healthcare consumer. They are driving online behavior, they're driving decision making, and they're doing things way ahead of where we're at. If we follow them, that's a great leading indicator. 
Specific facts on online, and I know this was mentioned too yesterday in uh, Dr. Swanson's presentation. 88% of online consumers look for health information online. We have a specific study that tracks social media behaviors that are just emerging. And we find that 21% use social media for health information. Another stat that didn't make it on here, 39% highly trust social media information. Advertising, for example, which all of us spend money on, is only 7%. So consumers are listening to other consumers. They're doing it increasingly so, and they're doing it all online. Online resources, I love this quote from Pew, including advice from peers, are a significant source of health information. Let's talk about a specific consumer here. This is Marge. Now, we look at Marge and we say, OK, that's one consumer. We don't need to wrap a strategy around that. But Marge, in particular, is married, got a couple of kids. She's got parents nearby. And over the course of a few years, they're going to need several different services. Now, looking at Marge, we know what? She's the primary decision maker for health care in her household. So she's going to be making decisions for her nuclear and extended family across all those different services. Suddenly, when we look at it from that uh, amount of information, from those services, and the money that can be made off of it, Marge absolutely matters. So here's the challenge. Make our promise, make our benefits, make our value intersect with what Marge values to be sure we can be clear, compelling, and obvious to her and do it over several years. Why? Because she's not thinking of us every day, every month, not even every year sometimes. So this is the challenge, reaching a person like this, showing value to a person like this, and then making sure we can operationalize that value and succeed financially. We did a qualitative study of almost 200 consumers this summer in a focus group setting, direct feedback. And if I could distill that down into five points for you, save you a lot of time looking through a lot of transcripts, the points are this. Marge wants control, but she doesn't have it. This is over healthcare purchasing. She has it in other industries. She doesn't have it in healthcare. She Googles anything and everything before she talks to her family. If someone thinks they have a healthcare issue, their knee's acting up, they go on Google. Why? Because it's free, it's convenient, and it's private. You don't necessarily want to rock the boat. So before she talks to a doctor or looks to the hospital for advice, she's going online, of which you can, of course, influence. That could be another access point to the consumer. But she Googles first, first and foremost. The next thing about the consumer, she does trust her doctor and does so more than anyone else, including family members. When she does get to the physician's office, when she does talk to the doctor, she understands their expertise, their knowledge. They may know her for several years. And she trusts that advice. Very important to know about consumers. Once they get to the doctor, that is. And when considering care, cost absolutely rivals health. You might be surprised by that. But we know in our nationwide study that there's consumers deferring health care, sometimes serious episodes and situations where they can't afford medication, they can't afford treatment. We also know from our qualitative study that consumers think health care costs are three times more than they actually are, which is way too high. So consumers really think that this better be important. This better be a life-threatening event for me to seek care, which is not the mindset we want them to have. Eliminating that mindset alone might do us quite a bit of good to get people being preventative, seeking care and wellness, and coming to the hospital when they should. And also, she expects advanced, coordinated care. She wants healthcare partners to work together. She's less concerned about the privacy issues that we see in EMRs because it's the Facebook era. She wants people to work together, coordinate care, and lower her bottom line all while providing quality, of course. No easy task. When she selects health care, this is a national study on what makes you choose health care. We always hear it's the physician, and really only the physician, or it's the health network, that's really all that matters. Those are true. They're very important. They're also number two and three on this list of national selection factors. Number one is the reputation of the hospital. The reputation of the hospital. So of course, that includes doctor interaction. That includes if you're in my coverage network. But it also is everything I've heard, I've read, I've seen about your hospital, from family, from friends, from you, the hospital yourself. It's everything I've thought about and experienced with the hospital. And that's why we're here talking about the consumer today, because they're choosing health care, when they are choosing health care, based on reputation. So here's our idea. Reputation and word of, word of mouth are as powerful as doctors and health plans. So when you think about what to move the needle on, if you're good in terms of affiliation with doctors, you've got great coverage, here's the next thing to work on, your reputation. Because again, Marge will be determining how she thinks about you, 
Your reputation is the number one selection factor, and she's got a lot of services she's going to need over the next few years. So that's consumers. But where do consumers and value-based purchasing intersect? So again, as a little bit of an outsider, I had to look up, I had to Google value-based purchasing. And when I did, I got very confused. So I was like the typical consumer event here. I found this uh, particular definition, which I'm sure is, is a great definition, from Health Policy Ohio. And I started to read it, and I got very bored. I was like, what does this mean? I know it's important about quality, and we're measuring, we're benchmarking. So as a little bit of an outside perspective, someone who works with consumers, here's what I think value-based purchasing means. I think we're moving away from the McDonald's model of a billion served. I think we're moving into value over volume. I also think that it's very important to understand how much pressure is put on hospitals. When I look across the sectors, I look at insurance, pharma, even doctors themselves, hospitals have incredible pressure in value-based purchasing. I mean incredible. The emphasis on benchmarking, of which the scales are very aggressive in some cases, is very serious. And these are benchmarks that didn't exist a few years ago, and they're now benchmarks that you're getting paid off of. And the difference in performance could mean shuttering your doors or making enough reimbursement to grow and expand. I also see it as a zero-sum financial game. The people that aren't performing, that money's going to be taken away, and they're probably the ones that need it the most, and given to those who are performing. So there's no second chances here, and that's how I view it from a little bit of an outside perspective. But the end goal is wonderful, and the means probably do justify the ends. That higher quality health care is the outcome, and this is probably what we need to get there. So that's how I view value-based purchasing. Now, on the other hand, consumer research, in some ways, is incredibly different than value-based purchasing and the patient experience. It's not required. You certainly don't have to do it. You don't have to go out and pull consumers in your market to ask them about their experiences. The government's not going to tell you to do that. I know that for three decades, I've worked for a company. I haven't worked for them for three decades, but they've been around for three decades, that has done this sort of thing, even though it's not government mandated. And there's been countless thousands of hospitals and health systems over the years who've used consumer research. So let's break that down a little bit more. These are easy metrics, by the way, if you need a little bit of a legend. This is hospital awareness. Are you aware of hospitals? Do you think they're high quality before you use them? Again, consumers can be patients, past patients, non-patients. They can be any number of people. Do you think that that uh, is an institution that you'll go to if you need a particular service? And that varies by service lines. Are you loyal to that institution? All pretty normal standard questions that we ask. Understanding these metrics gets a little bit more complicated. And that's where actually the value really comes in and you can make strategic decisions. There's fast metrics. Awareness can go up and down based on advertising, based on media coverage. Quality, perception of quality. If you have a wrong site surgery or an event, a doctor strike, nurse strike, your quality can really go down. Then there's slower metrics. Metrics we look at a little bit more. Those are metrics on image and reputation. It takes a long time to change that. If you've got a bad reputation, you've got your work cut out. If you've got a good reputation, you need to absolutely maintain it. Are people going to prefer you, use you, reuse you, recommend you to others? These are all really important metrics and trends that you can watch over time. That's generally what we focus on. Through this process, knowing that we have the resources through NRC to measure the patient experience and how important that is, but also the consumer experience, and market performance, we asked a question. Does a connection exist between patient experience ratings and consumer ratings? So are these two ideas linked in any way? Maybe, maybe not. We went in this completely unknowing of what the results would be. A little bit of background on value-based purchasing, not that I probably need to give it to this audience, but of course we know the rate hospital question on the scale, and we also know the would recommend question. Really a lot about quality and perceived quality of the experience. And then also, would you recommend or be loyal after the experience? Metrics driving consumerism are very similar. Again, this was not putting two congruent ideas together. This made a lot of sense. We ask consumers all the time, what's your first choice based on best overall quality? If you had to rate your care in a hospital, what's the best choice based on reputation? If a household member or family or friend needed a service, would, where would you prefer to go? And then who would you recommend to family and friends? So again, these different data sets existing out sort of independent of each other, really asking the same sorts of questions. So specifically, we looked at 1,200 facilities. So we'd look at facility A, their patient experience, and then their consumer perception. And then the same thing with facility B through number 1,200. 
We began with those 1,200 facilities. We had a little bit of a baseline. You had to have at least 100 HCAPS returns just to make sure the numbers weren't too funky. You had to have valid bed size data. You also had to have at least 50 consumer mentions. We put some analysis control in place where necessary. And here's what we found. The patient experience and the consumer experience, really the reputation, were absolutely inexplicably linked together, powerfully linked together. And here's how they were linked. The patient experience was positively and significantly related to consumer perception, and correlations were strong as six months later. So correlations were there a month, two, three months out, even two years out. But when you think about it, six months, that was sort of the watershed moment where something that happened in terms of an experience would make its way out into the marketplace. And you think about it, by six months, you've probably talked to everyone you're going to. You've probably done your follow-up, maybe your rehab, for the most part. By then, the experience made its way out into the marketplace. Now, we looked at a specific facility, and there would recommend versus most personalized care. Most personalized care being a consumer, metric, a consumer metric and recommend being a HCAPS metric. And they looked at these lines in real time, and they said, well, I see some connection, but I'm not so sure. But when you pushed the experience out, in this case, three months, to say, what happened down the road a little bit? Once the experience got out, once consumers started talking, you see a much better correlation. Not a perfect correlation by any means, but much better. Generally, when one metric went up, the other did. And when one metric went down, the other did. Which shows you, if you've got your experience numbers, what's going to happen in the consumer numbers. They're likely to go up. So again, using one metric off the other to create an early warning system or an early indication of growth. We also found that those with low experience scores had a much higher likelihood, 80%, had low consumer perception scores. And when they did, they were four times more likely to have those low scores go into the marketplace and damage their reputation, all based on the experience. So again, you've heard it, and you'll hear it again at this conference that the experience matters. Here's another reason why. Because it absolutely affects your marketplace. And if it's a negative experience, it affects it even more. You may be wondering some of the metrics that correlate the most, and these are all consumer metrics. Most personalized care. By the way, consumers want personalized care, and I heard it previously in, in Maureen O'Neill's uh, presentation. They want personalized. They don't want big, standard, scalable care. They want it to feel personal to them. Best accommodations, highest patient safety, best nurses, overall quality. We're all the strongest correlates in terms of the patient experience to consumer perception. So the good news is this. Facilities with sustained improvements that worked on the patient experience, they saw incredible results in the marketplace that then fed back in to better expectations and better experience internally. But those who had poor scores saw that in the marketplace. They saw their scores go down, and then that affects expectations. It affects the people that are going to come to your hospital, and it becomes a downward spiral. So again, very important to make sure you've got upward trends in your experience to ensure your marketplace perception follows suit. So the next question is not a question about a research study. It's a question for you. And the question is, does an experience exist between your, does a connection exist, excuse me, between your experience and the message you send to consumers? So a lot of folks here are in charge of quality. There's some nurses and doctors here, some executives here. I don't think there's probably very many marketers here or communicators here. Do you talk to your marketer? Is what's happening within the four walls of your hospital, which is very powerful, getting communicated in the right way outwardly to your market? Is there some cohesion between those groups? There should be. There absolutely should be. And the reason why is this. When you put consumer and patient together, it's when you achieve the total experience. So we know this from our research. What happens in your hospital today will impact how your facility is perceived in the marketplace. And it's going to do that to people who have never set foot in your doors. So the experience travels, up or down, it travels. This is not Las Vegas. OK, what happens in the hospital stays in the hospital. <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? That, that theory goes away right now. In fact, if it's negative, it's more likely to get out of the hospital, which I've had several people have gone to Vegas. I think that might be true of Vegas. If something bad happens, people tend to hear about it. It's going to get out. And it's going to be powerful, and it's going to affect the people that do come through your doors in the next 3, 6, 12 months, and on and on. The experience, in my mind, really has no beginning or ending, because people form expectations. Again, they gather information online. They do that all before they ever use you for services. 
They use you for those services, and we know how important the experience is, and then we go out, and we tell everyone, and we do follow-up. It all matters, and it's really just basically a circle. The experience never ends. The goal is to know and get in front of consumers as soon as you can to inform them on their expectation ahead of time so that the experience can be set up for success. I talk a lot about branding. I do that with executives. I do that with marketers. And one of the first slides that I show them is that your brand is your customer experience. So when we talk about the importance of experience, I say that across the country. And the reason is because the experience is several things. It is not just your business and communication tools, which are incredibly important, advertising, how you communicate with patients, newsletters that you may do. It's also on the bottom left, your digital channels. It's social media. It's the expanding web information. On the upper right, the experience is employee and physician interaction. Is the staff friendly? Are they helpful? Do they know what they're doing? Service, response, and follow-up. There's a session tomorrow on discharge calls. How important that is to make sure that even though you had a good experience, it can drop off if no one responds five days later. You have to ensure the experience travels. It's all a part of what the customer is going to perceive as their interaction with you. Even facility, presentation, appearance, wayfinding, some of the things we work on, safety, cleanliness, quality. It reaches further than the four walls of the hospital. Remember, the experience travels. To provide the best experience is incredibly necessary to have coordination and discipline. And we see a lot of hospitals that lack that. Hospitals build more silos than farms. A lot of times when we go to the marketing and branding folks, they're in the annex, they're two miles away, and they're disconnected from what's going on in the hospital. And that's your communication nerve center. That's where everything good in the hospital should be flowing through. You should be informing them what to talk about. And they would love to feel connected, too, by the way. It can absolutely be a win-win. Again, back to the consumer. Who drives the experience? Marge is going to, information gathering is going to be the first thing she does. She's going to form expectation. She's going to have the physical experience, the follow-up and conclusion, recommendation and referral. Only one of those things happens within the four walls. If we only focus inside the hospital, we only affect one of five different levers that Marge pulls in order as she has her experience. Make sure you're focusing on all five as much as you possibly can. We have a hospital that worked on this very idea, and it was challenging, but they had some success. And the first thing that they looked at, by the way, was their patient scores and their consumer scores. When you put those together, what can you do? You can put yourself in one of four quadrants. On the bottom left, if you have low patient scores and low consumer scores, what do you need to do first? A lot of times when scores are bad, we say, we don't know where to start. And you don't really start anywhere, and it kind of perpetually stays negative. The first thing you should do is focus on your experience. Because we know that three and six months down the line, that can make a change on consumer perception. So that's the first thing to do. If you're lost, if your scores are low. Focus on the experience. If you have low patient scores but high consumer scores, congratulations for now, but your perception in the marketplace will take a hit as more of those consumers experience your hospital. You have to get the experience in order. You got to get your house in order. If you're on the bottom right, you have high patient scores and low consumer scores. Have lunch with your marketer. Talk to the people that are informing your communication strategy. Make sure that you're spreading the word about the good things happening in your hospital that need to reach out into the marketplace. I see this one a lot. And it's very easy to fix. It takes communication. And if you're on the upper right, if you have high patient, high consumer, just go to lunch now. Congratulations. <laughs> be sure to maintain the momentum. Those things do change. You can never be good enough. People ask me, OK, if I'm going to focus on my consumer ride and I want to make sure the experience spreads out, what do I do? And usually the first thing I say is discover your uniqueness. We're all hospitals. We all use the color blue. We all have sort of the nurse and the doctor and the patient and the pictures. We don't do a lot of things differently. And I think there's been that mentality of regulation that sort of uh, prohibited us from that. But it doesn't anymore. Those veils have been lifted. And we can discover our uniqueness and talk about what we provide that's important to consumers. The first thing I'd tell you to do is that while it's important, do not focus your communications on functional benefits. So that might be a surprise to some people here. I mean, we're in charge of safety. I've got quality of care up there. I've got staff expertise, friendliness of staff. Say those aren't important. They're absolutely important. They're essential. They're what drives us internally. But they don't necessarily differentiate us from consumers in the marketplace because they expect staff to be friendly. They don't want low quality. They won't stand for it. They think the doctor should know what they're doing. So think about that. What we value, while important, does not set us apart to the consumer. 
who doesn't have our biases doesn't work in our hospital. In that case, you need to focus on access to care. Convenience is incredibly important. Pricing and options. Can you show me price transparency? Advanced technology is always a differentiator. Do you have the latest surgical equipment, the latest doctor expertise? Collaboration. Are you working with other systems, other medical groups, other sources of health care to ensure that I can get the best care possible for the lowest price? If you can show some of these things to consumers, they'll listen, and they'll experience your high-quality, safe environment with friendly nurses. They will absolutely do all of those in coordination. But you've got to highlight what makes you unique. And I guarantee you, if you're thinking, I'm not sure what that is, it's something, and you can find it. You have a point of difference. Every hospital does. No two are alike. So discover your uniqueness would be the message. Bronson Healthcare in Kalamazoo did this very thing. They were in firm second place position in their market, which was a small market. And there was more competition coming from other larger areas. And they decided to reduce all the different messaging that they'd done and all the different initiatives and go very simple with their positioning. They wanted to make the hospital not feel like a hospital. That was their revolutionary idea. They had nature that they brought inside. They had more of a, a feeling and environment of wellness and healing. They did some very simple, practical, consumer-facing things, I would call them. They had wider parking spaces, because those seem to just get smaller every year. I cannot fit in the parking space. They had wayfinding stations. This was not a big investment. They had stations set up every 100 feet. And an even smaller investment than that, they put in more benches. People said, I don't have a place to sit. I'm sitting here all day, and there's nowhere to just sit down and rest. They made very simple uh, communications to the market. They did have a facility expansion that they were doing. They wanted to keep the customer in mind with all of this. They wanted to reach the customer and align with what they valued. To do that, they looked at every possible touch point, not just the care being given, because they knew that it created a more holistic customer experience, things that you might normally overlook, things that could make you very unique. They put this all on a mind map. So the Bronson customer experience, what does all that mean? Gowns that cover you. I know Lynn made the joke about the paper gown. They actually did an ad around gowns that completely covered you, and it was an absolute success. And it pointed out in a lighthearted way that they care, that they focus on the things that other hospitals don't. And it was all part of their initiative. Nurses connected to patients, wider parking spaces, rooms designed to reduce infection. All very important things, but put in a different context. In a context of, I care about the customer, and I want to focus on what you value. You can see here that they had a, a facility expansion that occurred in the early 2000s. Um, they adopted a Waldridge criteria, and it took them some time to get this going. But eventually, they moved into the facility. They won some awards. They did eventually win the Baldridge Award, all based on this idea of Bronson quality, which includes more than just clinical outcomes. It included the entire customer experience and making sure it was second to none. And our data, just to corroborate, shows the success that they had from second place to a clear first place and best overall quality. And that, by the way, is a consumer metric. So what do we think about in this localized situation putting age caps and consumer metrics together? We see the same sort of trend. So on the, the, the two metrics on the left for Bronson and their competition, Borges, a great hospital, tough competition, was HCAP's rate hospital and HCAP's recommendation. And again, you see Bronson leading the charge against Borges. And to no surprise, the consumer brand rating, which is also about the hospital rating in the sense of quality, and consumer recommendation, patients and non-patients, also higher for Bronson than it was for Borges. So their experience was spreading out into the community, and they were seeing similar and consistent performance metrics outside of the four walls of their hospital. But it was all mirroring what was happening inside the hospital and, and what was happening in the experience. They are now clear in first place. They won the AHA McKesson Quest for Quality Prize two years ago. They don't just hand those out. They targeted extremely well, and they understood their competition before they spent any money. And it was all based on the experience, the experience of the customer and positioning that. They gave them reasons and lines of sight to believe. So to wrap up, quickly to conclude, I love to give people questions that they can talk about. You've got breaks. You've got the afternoon off. Maybe it's on the plane as you fly back with your colleagues. Maybe it's a meeting with colleagues that couldn't attend. Ask yourself these questions. What makes us different and unique? In the mind of the consumer, why are we different and unique? Are we better? Do we measure our total experience? Or do we have gaps in our perception that we need to fill? Do we communicate and promote our experience well? Is the left hand talking to the right? Can we expand our experience in the marketplace? 
And absolutely, you should try to. And of course, how are we going to measure all of this? How are we going to prove success? How are we going to make changes as necessary? The takeaway would be this. There's a link between the experience that you provide 